Bueno, vamos a pasar a la siguiente conferencia que tenemos prevista. Eh, os presento en primer lugar. Vamos a pasar a la siguiente conferencia que tenemos Wilhelm Whitman. Wilhelm Wilhelm es el Library Director de la Universidad de University desde 2012. Since uh, 2020, he's also senior advisor for the Open Science to the president of Estoril University. He has a master of arts in, in literature and a master of arts in library and information science from Uppsala University. Wilhelm is active in the open science movement in Sweden and Europe and uh, he is the vice chairman of the Swedish, Swedish uh, Bitsan Consortia and a member of the Swedish Rector Conference Open Science Group. He is also a member of the European University Association Esper Group of Open Science and one of the director of the European Open Science Cloud Association. So, uh, He's going to talk us about one of the most uh, important topic we are now traveling. Okay, so. Thank you for the kind introduction and thank, thank you for the invention, intervention to talk here at this wonderful conference about open libraries, open science and open learning. So I will talk about more about rights retention policies and negotiation with publishers from the perspective of the Bibsum Consortium. And my talk, I will start with a little introduction about open science, and then I will talk about policy work and strategies that we have done in Sweden, and also about the actual negotiations that we have had. And Finally, something about right retention strategies and maybe some small conclusions at the end. So you heard it before. I'm the library director at Stockholm University, senior advisor on open science to the president of Stockholm University. I'm a director of EOSC, and I think you will have EOSC on the program tomorrow. I'm a vice chair of the Bibson Consortia, member of the Swedish Rector Rector's Conference Open Science Group and a member of European University Alliance Open Science Group. So I try to run a library, but I work 100% on open science. So the library had to solve their questions themselves. So I'm out talking here at different conferences and at very many meetings out in Europe, is, as we understand, we need to work together internationally. So it comes very many meetings. So we have heard a lot about this to achieve the normal, achieve open science as the new normal. It's a transition. We're on the way making open science the new normal. And as we heard before here, you need a policy to make it required and rewarded. So start to have a policy. Then you also need a plan to clarify how the university shall achieve the goals, set out the policy and clarification of the vision of responsibilities. So you need to have a structure to work in. Then an internal organization an infrastructure to make it possible. And of course, a central support function and education to make it easy. So you have to go through all these different parts to have policy, to have infrastructure, to make research on it, and also have support and education to reach the goal. So it's a big way to go to make open science the new normal. So make it possible, make it rewarding, and make it the new normal. 
So what are the influences on open science? I will talk about some of them. So if we start with the politics in the EU, open science is really driven by the European Union, as we have heard before. They have a lot of recommendations on open science and a lot of projects on open science. And then the member states have it from their governance. So it's really politically driven. But I think it is important to have it top down politically, but we really need to work bottom up as well. Researchers don't say what politicians want and they won't do it just because the politicians want it. But then we have society. Open science is really important for the society to make it open to, that all members can have research articles can have it open to follow it. It's a big step for democracy to have everything in open science. And of course, ethics and laws influence how we can do open science. You heard as open as possible and as closed as necessary. So there you must follow the ethics and law, what you can publish open. Research infrastructures, make it possible to make open science. We have different research organizations that are working together to make open science possible. Then we also have the publishers, of course. The publishers can do much for open science and open access, but I'm a little bit afraid that they want to uh, have too much money to make open access possible. And we will discuss this as well. So publishers are important, but there are really big costs with the publishers. Then we have the funders. They all have are often financed by the governance. And then they have put mandates on the researchers when they receive research grants, as you have to publish in open access and you have to publish your data. So the founders are really important in this step, the top-down movement. But I think we always have to have the researchers in the focus. We are doing open science together with the researcher. It should be a movement that is bottom-up, and you can really see now many young PhD students at Stockholm University, for instance, is much more aware of open science than the tutors are at the universities. So the movement is coming bottom up as well, which is important to make it the new normal. But you also need leadership. This is the president of Stockholm University, Astrid Sedebay Widing. She says, Stockholm University advocates the availability of its research and research results through a research and education environment that promotes, encourage, and inform about open science at a, as a practice. So give open access and open science the attention they deserve. So you need to have this to make it work. You can do a lot in the libraries, but you need to work with the university management as well to make it happen. And I, I'm proud to work at Stockholm University that, that is the driver of open science in Sweden and mostly by our president, Astrid. So I will talk more about open access and how we try to reach 100% open access in Sweden. And here is a map of all the stakeholders when you're working on open access in Sweden. And it's a lot of stakeholders, as you can see. But to make it possible, you need to have all the different stakeholders at the table talking together. How can we reach the goals? So in the top, we have the government. And they have said that in Sweden, we should, that open science should be the normal in 2026. And they said that we should have had 100% open access in 2021. We didn't reach that, but we reached about 85% done. So they have got assignments on different parts of open science to the National Library has the assignment to work on open access, 
and the Swedish research councils had the assignment to work on open data. And then they have to work together in different joint committees. So if we talk about the open access part, we have the National Library, have the consortia, that is the Bibsum consortium. And the Bibsum consortia is steered by a committee from the Rector's Conference from the universities in Sweden. So we have the steering group is from the Rector's Conference and the management is at the Bibsum, uh, at the National Library. And within the consortia, we have all the universities and some governmental agencies. And then we have a lot of different joint action committees with researchers, with research founders and the universities talking together. And of course, we have coordination with the EU as well. So this is some sort of map of all the stakeholders that really need to work together to achieve the goal of open access and open science. So the Swedish Rectors Conference, it was established in 1995 and has 37 members. And that is the Swedish arena for cooperation between the universities and university uh, colleges. In, within the conference, we have also the Library Director Forum, and we have the SUH chair the Bibsum Steering Committee, and we have a committee that is looking over all open science questions, because as we have many different groups working on open science within the Rector's Conference, we have to have one group that looks over that we are doing everything together, and then we have had a group that we look on beyond transformative agreements. And I will talk more about that later. So to help the universities and the university colleges, we have started a roadmap for open science with nine recommendations. And that is, this is because of we have from the Ministry of Education, we have, they said that we should become open science in 2026. So we made a roadmap for open science. And we have nine different recommendations within this roadmap. And it is all, all about the culture of sharing, fair research data, infrastructural services, cooperation, and other things, promote and develop incentive structures and ensure copyright vis-a-vis -vis the publishers. And to uh, this roadmap is all of the universities trying to follow, but we made a guide for implementation of the roadmap for open science. So a complement to the roadmap, and it contains comprehensive proposal for action linked to the nine recommendations. And we have also proposed measures that are set for from 2022 to 2026. What should each university have done within, for instance, 2023? You should have started with something and we have recommendations here. So we provide overall support to all the higher education institutes, regardless of size or specializations. And of course, the roadmap is continuously updated once a year because a lot of things is happening. And then we follow up each year what is happening at the, each university within open science. So we have a sur survey to all the members each spring and the results are published on the website. And at the last sur survey we discussed, uh, we asked, is the roadmap and the implementation plan helpful for you at the university? And I think it was 90% that said, this is really helpful. And I'm at one university at the board on their open science project, and they had this roadmap open and said, this and this and this we have done now, follow the implementation plan. So it's really important that we work together and have this plan. And of course, it's not a mandated plan, but everybody talks on it. But I think, as I said before, 
here, you real it is from the rector's conference. It is from the top management of the universities that have the plan. Then we all, the rest, can contribute to make the plan happen. And it's really hard work to do it. So we heard that we are in the middle of the transformation. So from the UNESCO has the goals on open science and really recommending open science and all the countries have signed up the goals for open science. And as I said, the European Union has a lot of goals on open science and is really promoting open science and think it is important for the countries when you need to go to open science for democracy and everything. And then the different governments are really taking on open science. And I'm glad that also the new government in Sweden looks to have done it. And we will have a new research bill at the end of this year. And then we will re really see if the government has implemented things about open science in the research bill. So when Sweden in 2023 was had the presidency of the European Commission, we wrote the council conclusions on high quality, transparent, open, trustworthy, and equitable scholarly publishing. And the council conclusions is something that is negotiating, negotiated during the period. And all the member states and associated countries had signed up for the council's conclusion. Then it's not mandatory to do it, but it's a good signal with the council's conclusions. This is what the politicians want. And they call for immediate and unrestricted open access in publishing research involving public funds, immediate and unrestricted open access. And it states that the cost of paywalls to access and publish articles are becoming unsustainable. So the path we are on now is becoming unsustainable, is all of the countries of the European Union saying. So it calls on the member states to support policies towards a scholarly publishing model that is not for profit, open access and multi-format with no cost for authors or readers. Here we have a lot of projects now in the European Union about diamond open access, a new way to change the system and br bring the uh, power of the scholarly communication system back to the academia. And the, it also says that we should encourage member states to support the pilot program Open Research Eu Europe to create a large scale open access research publishing service on the EU level. And I know that many of the different founders in Europe is now talking how we can change or a Open Research Europe to become a common platform for the whole of Europe so all researchers can join it. But it will take time as everything that we do together on a big scale will do, but it's interesting to follow. And of course, they in the Council of Conclusions, they also talk about the, um, about the juridical things on how can we change the way how we do with the law to make open access possible for all countries. So in Sweden, we also have the government made an uh, amendment to the National Library to come up with natural guidelines for open science for Sweden. So they have a developed national guidelines and then have made goal and goals and priorities for open science in Sweden divided into six areas, open, open access to scholarly publication, open access to research data, open research methods, open educational resources, public and engagement in science and infrastructures supporting open science. And it 
provides support and guidance to actors in Sweden, mainly research performing and research funding on organization. And they are aligned with the UNESCO recommendations on open science. So here in Sweden now, we have the council conclusions that we can follow and that you have in all your member states. We have the roadmap from the Rector's Conference, and then we have the national guidelines from the Swedish government, but it was the National Library that made them. So we have a lot of policies and recommendations that we can follow, but policies is not all. We really need to have actual work to do it, of course, but policies are still important. <coughs> In Sweden, we had come far when to reach 100% open access. We had reached about 90%, and I think at Stockholm University, we have about 95% to our articles in open access. But as we have come so far, we had a discussion about within the Rector's Conference, this is not a transition we are going on. It is a new business model for the publishers. So the transformative agreements have become a new business models and it won't be changed. So what we set up a group to find a new negotiation way for the agreements of the 2024. And the strategy will be mandated from the management of the universities. And the group also investigated alternative publishing routes and gave suggestions on such. And we worked for two years in this beyond the transformative agreements. And within the group, we have university management, researchers from different disciplines, because all know that we have different publishing options within the different disciplines. We can't make one way to do it work for all. And we had the founders in the group and the negotiators from the Bibson Consortia. So I think we were about 14 people in the group. And it is all the stakeholders within the community to make it happen. So we worked during the pandemic. And so we have only online meetings discussing these questions. And we had a lot of international discussions, both with other consortias, other universities, and also with the publishers. We had different publishers on workshops together with us to discuss what is possible for the future. But at the end, we had a physical meeting where we discussed how can we come up with a strategy to get beyond the transformative agreements. And we had four different scenarios that we discussed. And the first one was, of course, to stop signing transformative deals and cancel deals with commercial publishers. What would happen if we follow that strategy along? And then we discussed new, different alternative publishing routes. How can these come in to the scholarly communi communication market to make it more open, to have more alternatives to publish than just with the commercial publishers? Then, of course, open access without APCs, article processing charges, and copyright to publications. And we talked through all these different scenarios that had come up during the work. And we said, of course, we can't just work, work, work on one scenario. We have to combine all these four scenarios when we are going forward to get beyond transformative agreements. So the group Beyond Transformative Agreements made a recommendation for the strategy. And then the Rector's Conference took all these recommendations and made this as a recommendations for all members within the uh, within all members within the director's conference. And 
this is what we say Sweden's path beyond the transformative agreement that is crucial that control of scholarly publishing remain with the academic community, but also that the cost of publishing decreases. Today, it is really too, it has not decreased, it has increased and is too expensive. And the Bibs and Consortia should not primarily enter into agreements for reading and publishing in so-called hybrid journals. It should not continue to sign transformative agreements. It should instead only negotiate agreements for publishing in open access journals. This approach should be implemented from 2026 and apply to all open journals regardless of publishers. So we say that from 2026, we should stop sign transformative agreements. And the aim should be to manage cost for academic reading and publishing at the national level as much as possible in collaboration between higher education institutes, founders and the National Library of Sweden. That is within the framework of the Bibsom Consortia. And here you're here again, we need to work together with all different parties to make this happen. Then in the Bibsom Consortia, of course, we have listened to what uh, we have done within the Beyond Transformative Agreements Group. So we had changed the action plan for the Bibsom Consortium. And the plan is, the aim is to facilitate the open publication of scholarly results to bring about a redirection of payment streams for a subscription based on open access publishing system and to achieve transparency and overview and reduced expenses for scholarly publishing. And that the consortium should not sign agreements for reading and publishing in so-called hybrid journals and instead only negotiate for uh, publication in open access journals and from 2026, as we said. The new pathway to open publishing are promoted and supported and alternative business models are developed and that research-driven journals that want to migrate from tra traditional publishers to other platforms are supported. And this is within the Diamond Open Access frame as well to support journals to move from commercial publishers to publishing within the institutions. And that publication occurs in an open license in accordance with the fair principles and that copyright conditions to promote open access, for example, via so-called secondary publishing rights are explored. So we are exploring about these different ways with the copyright conditions, how we can make open access more important and in a legal way. So, as I have said, Sweden has come really far with the transformative agreements. And maybe that's why we are late doing the other things. But we stopped in 2021 and said we need to do more things. We can't rely on the transformative agree agreements. So Sweden is one of the countries that have reached longest with the transformative agreements. We have nearly agreements with all publishers within the market. But it has been good to try it out. And Sweden has made a lot of mistakes during this period. And it has really been expensive. But as I said, we have reached about 90% open access to articles during this time. But what I'm always sad is to see other countries that start making transformative agreements and they haven't learned anything from the mistakes that we have done, although that we have been talking about the mistakes. So it, when we're not moving together and the publishers has easier to say, to the new countries what the transformative agreements and what components it should be within the transformative agreements. So I think we need to get, discuss this more and more internationally together, how we can move 
the transformative agreements to make them happen. So I said I should talk a little bit about actual uh, negotiations with publishers. And we, when we had made the strategy, we started to negotiate with Elsevier. And now that was last year. So we hadn't stopped the transformative agreements, but we said to Elsevier, we won't sign a proper transformative agreement. So when we started to negotiate, we needed common objectives. So we negotiated first on the common objectives for the negotiations. So what the common objectives between the Bibson Consortium and Elsevier for this negotiation was to have piloting an agreement beyond transformative agreements. Both parties agreed to move beyond the current transformative agreements to an agreement that is based on the services provided by the agreement, publishing reading platform, in particular publishing as a service. And it should be transparency. Both parties agree to work together to present information that explains how prices are set for the services and that helps the academic community make informed decisions. And sustainable prices. Both parties agree to negotiate with the aim to reach an equitable agreement before year end that will reflect the value exchange when it comes to services granted by this agreement. So these were the common objectives we worked for together. Then we had on all different points, we had different sight on those objectives, but it was a good starting point to start negotiating. So how could we get beyond the transformative agreement? So we started with a brain storming session between Elsevier and the Beepson Consortia. And from the Beepson Consortia, we talked about three different ways to move away. It was publishing as a service. We will only pay for publishing a post-transformative model or transition to publish, publish as a service as a new baseline and a softer move into publishing model. Or we also discussed the global equity model that was around status quo that the, the difference could use to make other countries move to open access. But if you see to the right here, this was what we started. We thought in Sweden that when we compared the license with Elsevier with other agreements, we see that we paid a too much for reading within this uh, license. So for our sake, we said that in the future, we shouldn't pay for the reading and we should be, we should find the price for the publishing. So we neg negotiated for the publishing as a service that we only should pay for publishing and not for reading. So that was when we went into the negotiations, we said, because we want to move away from the part when we pay both for reading and publishing. And in the new normal way, we should only pay what we like to pay for the service to get everything published. And meanwhile, when Elsevier is moving, to complete open access, we shouldn't pay for that that is behind the paywall. So we had long, long discussions about this, but uh, at the end, we reached a four years agreement. So if we say that we stop with the transformative, with the, the hybrid journals in 2026, it was stopped negotiating. So now we negotiated to, 2027. So we have all the content remaining in the agreement that we had before. So it's Science Direct, the complete freedom collection, and unlimited publishing in all core hybrid journals and the gold open access journals. And also we have 
sell press within the agreement and it's unlimited publishing there as well because 100 articles per year is what we are doing in Sweden. So when we took away the reading fee, because the reading fee during the agreement was phased out to zero. So when we took away the reading fee part of it, the agreement dropped with 11%, and it will remain on the same level for 2025 to 2026. So from Sweden, we pay, uh, pay approximately 14 million euros for this agreement. But for us, it was really important to may move away from the reading fee. And we moved away from it within the contract, and we could see that the contract dropped with 11%, and that is a lot of money doing it. But of course, this is... Now we have the agreement till 2027, and then there will be really different discussions in 2028, if Elsevier hasn't moved then. So the if we look at the price development of the Bibsum Consortia from 2012 to 2027, we had a reading part, and you can see from 2012 to 2017, it raised about 7 8% per year just for the reading part. Then we started to negotiate in 2018 to get the transformative agreement with Elsevier, but the negotiation failed. We moved away from the negotiation table because we couldn't get the things that we wanted from Elsevier. They wouldn't combine reading and publishing in a way that we thought was possible because they wanted us to get 20% open access the first year, 40 the next year, and 60 within the third year. And we said, no, we should have 100% open access and all reading. So we canceled with Elsevier and we was without an agreement for one and a half year. And then we started to negotiate again. And then we, in 2020, we got our first read and publish agreement with Elsevier. And it was when we reached that uh, agreement, it was on the level that we were paying just for reading. So we had unlimited publishing and reading within the same agreement for the same price as if we had continued to just have the reading part. And then in 2023, we started to negotiate with the new strategies. And as you can see in 2023, the expenses go down to another place that will stay until 2027. And if, if we had continued to just have the reading part, you can follow the dotted line there, then we should pay nearly 4 million euros more for just reading. So now I have 10 minutes left. But uh, so of course, you really need to negotiate with the publishing publishers. We are paying too much because if we look at the value of all the open articles compared to the list price with Elsevier, it should cost 84 million point seven, 84.7 million euros. And we pay now 14 million euros. So something is wrong with the APC model, of course. So I think we have done something with Elsevier and I see that other countries are following and discussing with Elsevier to take away the read fee component. So future work for us is to continue to ne negotiate for publishing as a service with other publishers. We are doing Taylor and Francis and Spring and Nature now and invest some of the money saved from the deductions in alternative publishing models. We are starting a node for Diamond Publishing in Sweden and trying to make a Nordic node working together with the Nordic countries on Diamond Open Access, engage in the discussion with, um, on Aura 
And I think we can get beyond the transformative agreements if we work together. Maybe you have seen the YISC study. They say if we continue as we are doing now, it will take 80 years for the transition. 80 years, then it's not a transition. So the problems here, many problems, is that different organizations within Europe and within the world have different policies. Horizon Europe, EOA, LERO, OA 2020, Plan S, all universities and more. We have policies for open access, but all are different. We don't have policies together. So we haven't aligned to one way to move. And aren't we united? It's hard to pressure the publishers, of course. So will there be a transformation? Very few publishers want to change their business models. Some are doing it, but many don't want to do it. Many publishers start new journals behind the paywall in a system when we are moving to open access, start journals with behind the paywall. We have business model built on print spent and APC spent. It's crazy. And we can see now when the journal prices for reading goes down, the APCs are increasing. So, of course, no, that's not sustainable for the future. And it's, of course, no transparency about what we are paying for. And I don't think that we can rely on the APC model for the future. That's why we are talking about publishing as a service, not based on APCs as such. And how can we get to the transformation? International discussion and cooperation, build alternative publishing routes, write retention strategies, put pressure on the publishers to be transparent about the costs, be ready to walk away from the negotiation table. If we don't act, it will be no transformation. Take the ownership of the publishing system back to the academia, and it is the researcher's behavior that can change. And now to... I have five minutes, I hope, for the R RS strategies. We discussed it in Sweden, but we haven't come that far as in UK and as in Norway. And as I'm the uh, chair of the uh, library board at Tromsø University in Norway, I will take an example from uh, Norway. The Ministry of of education and research has stated that all research should be openly available in 2024 in Norway. And Plan S requires that from 2029. And UNESCO, of course, open access to scientific papers is a core value in the society. So, and all we have signed different declaration. So from Plan S, the minimum requirement, a zero embargo CC by license, on the AAM in a repository that is green open access where you put your manuscript without embargo. And author, so the immediate open access is challenged by the publishers. Authors must sign a copyright transfer, transfer agreement or exclusive license to publish. Publishers take control of the right to the author's work often impose an embargo for self-archiving in AAM, in repositories. So the right retention strategies are based on simple principles. The peer review AAMM is the intellectual creation of the authors and belong to them. Lifting off embargoes is safeguarded through a right retention strategy at your university. The researchers can publish in their journals of choice. The CC BY license of the AAM allows our authors to share the AAM in a repository and to freely reuse their own material as they see fit. And research is immediately open. This sounds simple. We can make it open with a strategy and demand the researchers to put their AAM in the repository. And they have done that at Tromsø University. But of course, the researchers can opt out. They have had the strategies for two years, and it's only three researchers that have opted out. And the library helps the researchers to put the AAM with a license in the repository. So they are really ma making change here with their RSS strategy. 
Um, it, of course, it was a process whether discussed internationally with others that have done RSS as Harvard University. And really the top managers, management was involved. And at last director formally adopted the new open access policy with the right retentions strategy. So key points here that researchers can publish in the journals of choice our uh, authors retain intellectual property right to their work and self recording by CC BY. Authors do not have to inform the publishers about their RSS. The University of Tromsø take the legal responsibility. So if any publishers will start discussing this, they need to do it with the rector of the University of Tromsø, and they haven't started discussing that yet. So conclusions. We are in the middle of a transformation to make open science the new normal, and we need to speed it up. To make it happen, you need to have strategies, policies, hard work. We can reach the transformation to 100% open access, but we need to align our strategies within Europe and outside of Europe. We, tried, we need to try different paths to open access, new business model, dynamic open access, and right retention strategies. And if you want to know more about what we are doing in the BIBSAM consortium, it will soon come a new article in the Spanish journal CSIC, how can we get beyond the transformative agreements, a Swedish perspective that I have written a couple of months ago and it will be published next month, I think. Thank you.